All right, welcome back everyone to another edition of Dermatology Grand Rounds, Seborrheic Dermatitis Edition. I am so fortunate to be joined by my partner in crime in this Derm uh, Grand Rounds uh, kind of journey, and that would be with Melody Young. And we're gonna talk about some interesting seborrheic dermatitis cases today. Welcome, Melody. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, the photos you have here. I can't take credit for these. These are selfies. But, and to your point, this was somewhat of an unusual case. So this was a 25-year-old woman, and I give a very specific date here because I was in clinic wrapping up, and I get an urgent text from someone at GW saying, I need you to see this patient immediately. This is a facial allergy. Her face is on fire. She works here. Please, please, you got to help me here. It's probably a contact dermatitis. Now, looking at these images, I could get the thinking of like, wow, is this, you know, a contact dermatitis? Is this maybe a piece of a systemic disease? But something, and, and it's a little nuance here that can help kind of focus on this being seborrheic dermatitis versus other. So notice the real involvement of the central face, you know, even though it's extending these thin kind of off-white plaques, some of them almost looking like the leaf of a plant or a giant petal of a flower coming off the nasal labial fold. Um, I think location matters and so many things in life. It certainly does when it comes to uh, dermatology and generating a differential diagnoses based on reaction patterns and, of course, um, what the actual primary and secondary lesions are. You know, we see evidence on her forehead. We see involvement of her eyebrows, some mental crease. So while this is a very robust example, if we stick to the basic description, it still gets us to something in the seborrheic world. So, of course, I said, yes, send her down. Happy to see her. And so the story expands a little bit in that this has been getting badly very quickly in the last 24 hours, rapidly escalating. However, this is not a one and done. And I think the discussion about acute versus an acute flare of a chronic issue or just a chronic thing has to come up because she has had similar things in the past, not as bad as this, and she's managed with topical steroids. So I, I think that we kind of got into the what would you do here in terms of taking a step back and thinking, all right, what is our differential diagnosis? Um, I think sometimes we are presented with these acute flares, and it's so easy to have uh, differential Tourette's and throw out diagnoses all over the place. We want to stick to our basics. We want to describe what we see based on the description, use the reaction patterns. Is this epidermal or dermal? Is this path squame versus eczematous? And then we can stay on track to get to the diagnosis. The other thing that I think is really important is that seborrheic dermatitis comes in many flavors. The kind of historic description of, you know, you know, greasy, caked on scale on an erythematous plaque just involving the T-zone is absolutely not true. We know this affects the scalp, the contra bowl, the ears, the central chest, anywhere there are a lot of sebaceous glands, it's possible. But then in different skin tones, that pink or red may be more purple or violaceous. It may be off white like we see here, which I see really commonly in petaloid seborrheic dermatitis, which we would only see in, in darker skin tones. So this case highlights the importance of appreciating the spectrum of clinical presentations of even something so common. But then of course, what do you do about it? So now knowing this is Sebderm, Melody, what, what are we gonna think here? My assessment when I was looking at it was, I was thinking, what is it that I know for sure? And what is it that I'm not sure of? So I know for sure she had an underlying thing and the pattern, especially the giveaway for me was looking at her hairline. And then you were talking about the eyebrows and then the nasal nasal labial creases and then that little bit of erythema. She had a couple of patches over, I believe it's under her left ear. I looked at it and thought lupus, you know, it was kind of well-defined, but that didn't make sense for everything else. I mean, I would have to rule out a few things. So I'm, you know, I'm, I probably would take me a minute to be confident in what the diagnosis was besides Sebderm. And it probably was some contact dermatitis, as you said. She used a new facial that caught a facial product that had sort of caused this crisis, this moment of crisis that she needed help immediately. And I would be back in the well. I know what she has for sure, so I'm definitely going to go that route. And quite frankly, because she has subderm, even if she has contact derm on top top of it, I go great. I can get you a new subderm treatment that's probably going to help you with the eczematous patches and this acute situation that you have going on as well. 
um, and not going to hurt you with it. So I, and you know, tolerability is great, even in compromised skin. I would have, I would have put her on reflumilast foam and just said, here's what we're going to, and if, you know, we don't have foam samples in clinic, PO cream samples in clinic, I would have grabbed some of that and just said, start doing it and see what happens. Maybe a useful story depends on, uh, I always think about steroid withdrawal, if they'd been using triamcinolone cream very recently, uh, you know, thinking about that as well, put her on what I call a skin cleanse, meaning not going to let you use anything on your face except for what I tell you you can put on your face. And, you know, we would have gone down that road and I probably would have brought her back or at least had her send me pictures. Well, she worked down the hall from you, so I guess that made it convenient. But I would have followed up a little more closely on this one than I would have with most sebderm cases. A hundred percent. And clearly she has my cell phone too. Who knew? Um, all right. So let's, let's go to what I was thinking about. And I, I agree with everything you said. And, you know, when, when you see such a severe case and the patient is so disabled, um, sometimes topicals are not enough. Um, and I do consider some of the systemic off-label options. So we look in the literature, um, Azole antifungals have been used. I think one of the thoughts was, well, we know that malassezia might play a role. And I guess the chicken or egg is the alterations in the Petri dish, aka our skin, facilitating malassezia overgrowth, which then facilitates more inflammation, or does malassezia overgrowth lead to this inflammatory state? We don't really know. We also know azole antifungals are anti-inflammatory. Either way, there is evidence supporting their use. Um, Terbinafine is interesting because it has no effect on malassezia, so why would that work? But of these, honestly, when I go systemic, I love low-dose isotretinoin. This is not something I'm reaching for day one. This is for those patients who are not responding to any topical therapy. And based on the historic literature, anywhere between 10 to 20 milligrams a day. And I'll try to get to alternate day dosing as well. Now, in the literature just recently, there was a comparative study, um, and which I'll show you in a moment. This is a, uh, you know, this was another study where they looked at, you know, what was the average dose per day uh, across the spectrum of several like anecdotal reports. And here is about 9.2 milligrams a day uh, for four months. I, I do try to get them off, but some patients can only get down to maybe like every other day or every third day. It really is variable depending on that severity. But at least based on this, they're saying 10 milligrams for the day is probably enough. But in the more recent study, we found that actually 20 milligrams or 10 milligrams a day was actually more effective. But obviously, the higher the dose, the more likelihood for xerosis, dry eyes. But we're still talking about minuscule doses compared to the dosing we do, like one mg per kg for nodule cystic acne. So I think this is a good option to think about, to have in your back pocket for the handful of cases you may see that do not respond to, to topical therapies alone. But this was not what we did in this case. So in this case, uh, given the severity, I'm like, you know what, let's pulse you with some fluconazole for a couple of weeks. Uh, I think part of that was also the gravitas of being an oral given how distraught this patient was. Um, now we do not have samples of reflumolast foam, but we had cream, which is approved for psoriasis. So I gave some off-label samples, like get started with this or the foam. And I'm like, all right, just to your point, that quick follow-up, so hugely important for adherence, but also engendering a sense of trust. I'm like, I'm going to see you back in three weeks. We'll see how you're doing. But given she had my cell phone, she didn't have to wait that long. And so 24 hours later, I get these selfies. Remarkable improvement yeah. just in 24 hours after one application of reflumolast cream. Um, now, I want to be very clear, an N of one is not scientific. But to me, this I feel like was very telling and was um, you know, extremely helpful in terms of guiding my decision-making with respect to utilizing maybe one topical over another. But uh, needless to say, she was very happy and she did not take the pulse glucosal. She's like, I'm good, I got this. Um, so clearly a, a remarkable case, not uh, representative of all experiences, but certainly an interesting one here. Um, and so we published this recently, if, if you want to read more about what we did in the case a little bit more um, in the June 2025 Journal of Drugs and Dermatology. So if you want to read more about this case, please feel free to do so. And that is all she wrote. Uh, Melody, always a pleasure. Thank you for sharing your insight, your humor. And uh, you know, now I'm going to turn it over to you to review your slides. Okay. So I'm going to tell you another case of fairly rapid response with Refrumbalas, since she said that sort of turned into the theme. 
I had a lady sent to me, which I often do from an um, outlying dermatology clinic when they've tried one or two biologics. So one of the great things is now even special non-specialty clinics know how to use biologics, which is great. So this lady comes in saying, I have psoriasis. So I start talking to her and she, she told me the things that she had tried and failed, which were very good, highly predictably effective biologic agents. And so I looked and said, show me where it is. And I started looking at it again, going back to the pattern where is it? What does she not have? The, the history and the itch was intense. When I started looking at it, I, you know, it just did not have the appearance of psoriasis. And sometimes there's an overlap, SIBO psoriasis. And I really told her, sorry, I'm going to contradict the other people you've seen, but you do not have psoriasis. You have sebderm and I can biopsy it if you want, but I'm confident in that. And there's just, you just don't have the features of it. So with this lady, this extreme itch, you can just tell the excoriations. You can see the yellow scale um, on the, you know, clinging to the hair. Um, let me show you some additional, additional pictures because she did not have psoriasis or any other patches any other where any other place and did not she always had a little bit of dandruff and nothing nothing like this so i told her we're going to stop what you've been doing um it's not working and the data shows us with almost everything that she had tried that no one got worse in those trials and it worked a little and she had had complete failure and we're going to stop the steroids they were not doing anything stopped all the medicated shampoo she had done and said, I'm going to start you because at the time, you know, again, didn't have the phone, but that's all I want you to do. You're going to do monotherapy of uh, 3.3. So let me show you what happened with her. So she wow. comes back in four weeks because I brought her back sooner. Who would have thought that I would think Sim Durham would require a closer follow-up? <laughs> than some of these other things that we manage that, you know, are problematic, but the, the itch within four weeks of her coming back. So literally she had less because it took a couple of days for them to come in less than 30 applications of the medicine already remarkably better. Still, she said, I'm a little bit itchy, but not in day. And it happened quickly. So let me show you what the progression looked like. So I said, okay, well, we're on a roll here. Now you trust me. Uh, now you know I'm not crazy. And so, you know, when she came back in at the three-month mark, her patches were just minimal redness only and no more scratching and told her then, she's, then it was, well, how long to keep going? The itch comes back, you use it. But this will be your monotherapy. You're very fortunate. You don't have psoriasis. Um, and this is all we have to do. So now she's on a PRN follow-up situation, and I gave her a year's worth of refills and, said, let's see how, how it goes. Yeah, I, I find distinguishing between subderm and SIBO psoriasis can be challenging. And, and while this may not always be present, one of the helpful clues I find is with SIBO psoriasis, it often will come and extend beyond the hairline. So the confluent plaque, granted, you know, we saw in my case where the patient did have some involvement in her forehead, but it wasn't that close to her hairline. Sebderm stays put. It stays within the kind of body of the scalp, whereas SIBO psoriasis, that confluent plaque, and yes, you could also have like more hyperkeratotic scale or confluent scale. It often will track down beyond that hairline, and that I have found to be a helpful clue. The other thing is when you're thinking about it, look for other signs of psoriasis. You know, the subtypes of psoriasis tend to run together. So I often find SIBO psoriasis, those patients also have nail psoriasis, look for onycholysis, nail pitting, or they have inverse psoriasis, right. ask about the junk. Patients will not volunteer, I got a rash down there. Uh, they probably don't uh, affiliate the two together, they may be connected. So I think it's important if you're trying to distinguish, and especially before throwing them on a biologic, see if there are any other clues that can distinguish between the two. But yeah, this patient had a, a great response. So uh, great, great job simplifying things for her, which I'm sure she was very appreciative about. All right, well, that wraps up another wonderful edition of Dermatology Grand Rounds, this time Seb Derm 
style. And honestly, like never in my wildest dreams did I ever think we'd be having a conversation at this scale or even saying grand rounds and separate dermatitis in the same sentence. Uh, but it is certainly a new age where we are paying attention to diseases that have been in the shadows, even if they're super common. And of course, by doing so, we are hopefully getting these patients the relief they deserve. And uh, very much thanks to folks like you, Melody, who are paying attention to these cases, to these patients and getting them the treatment they deserve as well. Sometimes it's it's uh, what we think are the little things that can be really meaningful and life altering for patients. So itch is a miserable thing to suffer with. I'd rather have pain than itch any day. And when you can alleviate itch, you're going to make a patient very, very ha happy. I mean, I prefer neither personally, but I, I get where you're coming from. But yeah. uh, thank yeah. you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for another edition of Dermatology Grand Rounds.